So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the sharp uh, forks we follow. And I'm calling them sharp because sometimes they, they are painful. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with the term uh, fork, uh, I'm going to also introduce it briefly for those who are not familiar with it. But I want to take a different, uh, I don't want to take a very uh, technical uh, approach to it. I want to uh, have a social take on what are uh, forks, uh, what are they good for, what are the dangers they, they have. Uh, we're going to uh, cover some examples on how a group of people uh, split and um, some example in the uh, Bitcoin and the Ethereum communities. So first of all, uh, myself, I'm a software engineer. I've been working in open source for several years. And I've been working in crypto for uh, three years now. And for me, it was uh, this topic. Um, I, I got fascinated since I learned about the, the DAO hack and, um, and how the, the Ethereum uh, blockchain split in two. So this is my first attempt at trying to formalize a bunch of questions and a bunch of ideas and discussions that I've been having with people throughout these three years. So it's, uh, if something is not clear at the end, please, I'll be uh, very, uh, very happy to receive your feedback. I'm trying to, to, to make a nice talk with this and, and repeat it in the future. So every input will be appreciated. So, Fork. So a fork, I like to see it as a dispute resolution mechanism. So um, the, the, the word fork, if we look at where it comes from, it can be, uh, it has many exceptions, but one of them is uh, in, a, in a road. There is a, another road that you can take, and then there are two. In, in software uh, development projects, what we refer with forks is uh, you create a new branch and you start developing this new branch on your own independently of how the original team or the original author was doing it. And in blockchain, what we mean by forks is, well, it, it builds on, the, on this principle of open source forks that we are changing the, the source code that is implementing the protocol. And in the case of blockchains, it's uh, a bit more tricky because it's not just uh, the source code that is available for anyone to use now. This source code needs to be run by, by machines. And they're going to be providing some uh, infrastructure that provides some uh, features. And these features uh, allow for transaction of economic value. So it becomes really tricky. So I would like to expand first on what uh, forks are in blockchain space. And specifically, I want to focus on hard forks, not soft forks. And so to, to make the distinction between um, a hard fork and a soft fork, a soft fork is um, a variation of the software that implements a protocol um, that is backwards compatible. So that means that some people in the network can still run the old version of the code and still be compatible with the new uh, operation, new uh, messages in the in the protocol. While uh, a hard fork means that some people in the in the community will be running a different version of the of the software that will not understand exactly. Uh, what's going on in, if you run the other protocol. And that's why it's called hard. So um, if you are running this version, you cannot talk to the other. And then the blockchain splits into um, two chains of history of transactions. And in comparison, again, to uh, software forks, it's not, um, uh, you can have two software forks. And the difference is that, well, maybe you have a part of the community that is running Node.js. And maybe for some time, some people in the community decided that some aspects of how the, uh, the development team was implementing new features in Node.js, and they forked off, and they made uh, io.js for some time, and then they, uh, they merged again. 
So be, uh, inside hard forks, uh, we can also look at different kind of hard forks. So some, some of the hard forks can be accidental. So maybe some uh, nodes in the network are running uh, a faulty uh, version of the, uh, of the software that doesn't implement correctly the protocol, and it has some breaking change that not everyone in the network can understand. So that effectively creates two uh, chains in the, in, the, in the blockchain, and, and the two parts of the network cannot speak to each other. It can also be that uh, the community is uh, conscious of what the changes are going to be, so they have some interest. There is some motivation behind um, why they want to change the protocol and the software that implements it. Um, but the ones that I really want to focus on are those changes that are contentious. That means that part of the community don't agree with, with those changes, and they will stay running a different version of the, um, of the software. And some others will say, well, I really want this thing. I'm going to uh, make the changes for myself. I'm going to start running it. And at the same time, I'm going to convince other people to run this software as well. And I will be able to communicate with them and to have our own blockchain. So more generally, what I wanted to, to focus on is uh, forks are a dispute resolution mechanism when there is a state of dissensus. That means that it's a group of people that don't agree on how things should change or how things should remain. So if we look at uh, open source projects traditionally, and even nowadays, we, you go to GitHub and you see that there is a fork button. You can fork, you can make your own changes. Um, it can be, uh, and you may do that because maybe the, the features that are available in the, in the version of the, uh, of the main uh, version of the software out there don't, don't provide. And you may say, well, this is very common. Sometimes you have to fork, work on a, on a feature that you need. Maybe you can propose and submit back uh, into the, the main branch of the, of the project. Uh, it can be about policies to be followed in a cryptocurrency network. So in Bitcoin, there have been lots of discussions about the block size. Um, but there could be also, uh, in the future, discussions about other parameters in the, in the protocol, like the, the total supply of Bitcoin. So uh, is there always going to be 21 million? Well, this is a matter of people that are uh, executing that software that implements that protocol that must agree that that's something desirable for them. But there can be also forks that are based about the principles that the decentralized infrastructure should follow. And this example is uh, very clearly highlighted in the Ethereum fork. So uh, after the DAO hack, the Ethereum blockchain split in two. And one of the, the main fork today uh, violated one of the uh, core principles of uh, blockchain, which was immutability. So because a, a large uh, portion of the community in Ethereum lost uh, a significant amount of, uh, of value, uh, at the end, the, the fork got, well, the, the dispute got resolved by, okay, we can forget that this happened, and now we can all agree that we didn't lose this money, and this caused a bunch of people in the community to say, well, no, we really wanted to stick to immutability, and we are actually going to keep on mining on the chain that is keeping track of that fact. But then the, the, the forks can have multiple reasons, and here I want to, I would like to look at what is it that first bring people together. So in the case of uh, Ethereum, what brings people to work together is because they maybe believe in the properties of the, of the infrastructure or the uh, possibilities that it enables. So it's technological, it can be political, economical, or even theological, because uh, the, the, cons the notion of uh, immutability, well, it didn't come with the universe. Like, things are not immutable. Things are constantly changing. But we tried to believe that that was a possibility, and some people decided to, to fight for that. Uh, it can be economical. In the case of Bitcoin, uh, 
people, the community, believe that there might be some uh, good uh, properties that come from having a total supply limited, bounded to 21 million, and they will try and, and make that stay, or believing that increasing the block size to two megabytes might have uh, unintended consequences that will be harmful for, for them or for the community. Or political, also, if you think that by um, keeping a certain story among the community, you will have some personal benefit or you will have some, or some group of people will have some benefit, they will fight for that. And here then I would like to go very quickly through some uh, epic hard forks in history and not just limiting them to, to blockchain space because I want to look at them from any kind of uh, split between a group of people. So we can start very simply with um, a group of friends that st stop liking each other and they stop seeing each other, or a marriage that they don't stand each other and they, and they get divorced, um, a hunter-gatherer tribe that is wandering, roaming the, the land and they are thirsty and they don't know where to go to, to fetch some water, and part of the, of the tribe, they say, well, we're going to bet going that direction, hope we find water. And the other one will say, no, we're going to shoot in that direction and hope we find water. So they effectively split, take different uh, paths. Um, it can be a, a, a religion, a schism. So some people are believing that they have to pray to a god, but not quite in the same way. So they get angry, and they, they write a manifesto, and they stick it on a, on a church, and they, they rally other believers to do things in that way, to interpret the, the scriptures in some way, or uh, a decaying empire that uh, cannot keep the social order, and then different uh, territories start having a different leader that propose how things should go, and this was the, the Roman Empire, that's played in the, in the Western and the Eastern uh, empires. So uh, as I was uh, preparing for, for this talk and, and I was looking for definitions, I was actually very surprised to, to find that in English there are so many words to refer to how uh, people split. So we have schism, uh, secession, split, divide, now fork. So it seems to be something that is very common in human nature. We come together, but we also... Uh, take part, uh, uh, take our um, journey apart. So, I would like to also take a small uh, detour on, on slicing the noosphere, because all of these, uh, I, I need to introduce, introduce these uh, concepts. So what is the noosphere? The noosphere is the, the sphere of all ideas. So um, this field is an infinite space. So every idea can be copied, and it's not uh, preventing anyone from using that idea. Uh, this is a concept that I was introduced by Eric Raymond, uh, author from the Cathedral and the Bazaar. So it's a, an open source developer and open source uh, advocate. And he was, back in the 90s, exploring the uh, the notion of property in open source. So he's proposing that uh, a software is a collection of ideas that you can infinitely uh, copy. Um, but then if you can copy it infinitely, what is it that makes people choose one version of that copy? I'm sorry. Again. So it, it's interesting because in, in, in open source you have both uh, abundance dynamics in which everyone can copy every idea and make it their own. You can go to GitHub, uh, click the button, copy it, uh, have your own version of the, of the uh, software. But at the same time, if you're going to install Debian, you're not going to download it from any random fork that you find on the, inter in, on the internet. You're going to go to a trustworthy source of... Uh, distribution channel. You will check the PGP signature. You want to know what you're downloading. You are trusting 
the people that are curating the, that distribution or implementing uh, Python interpreter, you want, because let, let's be honest, we don't check that the code is doing exactly what we think it's going to do. So we are always outsourcing this trust to the maintainers of a project, to the uh, maintainers of a distribution. So what I want to say here with slic sl slicing the nose here is that we're slicing something that is infinite, but people have to choose at the end which one of these variations of the protocols, softwares, uh, or ideas are going to follow. So there are some limitations here, which is, although we can infinitely fork projects and infinitely fork ideas, um, if we keep on doing infinitely, um, we may end up with us being the only user, which sometimes that's desirable. But when we're talking about protocol forks and uh, infrastructure that is allowing for people to uh, transmission value, then we cannot, it, it's not very useful if we have our own private blockchain with our own private protocol. So there, there is some limit as to how much we can split things. Also, if we make the analogy with other social organizations, um, if you think of a tribe in the wilderness, maybe you can say, well, I, I don't like any of you, I'm going to go my way, but then you may not survive. So uh, forking has a cost, and it seems like net network effects uh, make people sometimes not to be willing to fork uh, either because they are comfortable with what the, the community is providing or what the infrastructure is providing. And sometimes it's simply because it's too expensive to, uh, to go along. So on the limits of forking, uh, my, my intuition here is that when we make things easier to, uh, to fork, um, what we are facilitating is for things to decentralize because everyone can just take their own version of things and find rally a group of people that are going to agree with, with the initiator, uh, initiator of the fork to maybe there is something good in what I'm proposing. Um, but at the same time, if you keep forking, you can go to CoinMarketCap and uh, see that most forks have very little value compared to the main fork. If you go to open source forks, you see that uh, small forks have very little uh, effort being in, uh, invested in. So at the end, people will go to the um, fork that is primarily followed which is also a case for how, uh, why not all things can be decentralized. And this is, this is my, my current intuition as to why we cannot fully decentralize. Our attention cannot be fully decentralized. We, we tend to focalize on, on projects, on people, on ideas. But what are the, what are the, um, there is one, so I'm, I'm missing one, one slide, sorry. But I, I wanted to talk also what are the, the main elements that make us choose one variation of a protocol or another, or a set of ideas or another, or just everything that comes with them. So it can be trust, trust in the maintainers, the reputation of the developers that are pushing forward new, new features in the, in the project, it can be the stability that it brings, like in Bitcoin, you may not want to choose a fork because, well, it's been running for a while, most people are there, it's less likely that it's going to change rapidly, that provides some stability as to what the value of the currency is going to be. It can be about purity, it can be, no, 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 we really believe that things should be preserved for posterity, so we're going to keep mining on the fork that is... Um, uh, keeping track of all transactions, even though many people lost a lot of money uh, with that. Or it can be just propagandistic reasons. Maybe some group of people have very compelling way of telling a story, and then other people just follow along. So 
just to finish, I would like to have uh, two study cases, one on Ethereum versus uh, Ethereum Classic, and another one between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. So if we look at the Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, uh, I, just to give some context, so it uh, happened after the DAO hack. This was a smart contract that proposed um, um, a, a system for uh, giving grants for development of the Ethereum ecosystem. And everything was uh, going well until someone found um, a problem in the smart contract that could uh, siphon out the, the value in the contract. And then a, a lot of money went out. So the, the solution was, okay, we can forget this happened and have another version of the protocol that will patch the, the contract. So therefore, the community wouldn't have lost this uh, money at the hands of hackers. There were also some discussions as to, well, if Ethereum is marching towards proof of stake, if we don't do anything, these hackers will have a significant uh, stake in a future system. So do we, have, do we want to have people in this community that will have uh, voting rights gained through uh, means that we deem um, non-ethical? But some people may say, well, it's responsibility of each one of us that when we deploy a contract, we should make sure that it work as expected, and if it doesn't, well, it's, it's the price to pay for having such a system. So the way I see this fork is that uh, not only a big part of the community were interested in uh, not losing value, it was also that the Ethereum Foundation and, and Vitalik proposed, well, we can, we can do this, we can prevent the community from having this large loss. So we're going to make this change in the protocol. It's a, it's a hard fork. It's a breaking change. It's not going to be backwards compatible. If people want to keep mining in the other fork, they will not be compatible with this fork. And that effectively made Ethereum to become two blockchains with two different currencies. I think it was a very uh, technocratic and reputation-based uh, fork because people look up to Vitalik as the person who uh, created this, this blockchain. So if he was going to keep maintaining and developing in that fork, it was natural, in my opinion, that many people in the community decided to follow along with that fork. And it was also a theological uh, fork because some people really believed that immutability was something worth defending, even though their value by keeping uh, the, the Ethereum classic and not selling it for Ethereum was a way to commit to that idea that immutability is valuable and the developers that kept uh, developing Ethereum classic, they are showing uh, their uh, willingness to lose. They, they, could, they could have sold it uh, at the beginning, and, but no, they decided to, st to stay there and defend that idea. And finally, a different uh, study case. We have Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash. This was, um, it started with a contentious discussion about block size as to how many transactions can, bo can go into, into every block. Then it got tangled with uh, SegWit discussions and it blew up eventually with people saying, no, 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 we are being more truthful to the original idea of Satoshi Nakamoto, and that's why we're going to make these changes in the protocol, and we're going to develop it this way. But if we look at how it got resolved in the end, uh, we see that uh, people also made very strong uh, propagandistic campaigns. If you go to Bitcoin.com, you will see that it's, it, it tries to portray Bitcoin Cash as an equivalent to Bitcoin Core or perhaps as an improvement to, to Bitcoin. It's not clear. So if someone is not familiar with the Bitcoin ecosystem, they will go to Bitcoin.com, sounds um, legitimate enough, and they will say, see that Bitcoin Cash seems to be better or, it, and they will not be sure which one to go for. So this is what uh, I mean that uh, when forks get resolved, there might be because of technological reasons or all the way to 
uh, propagandistic reasons. It's about the story that they tell, or it's about the, the reputation that the maintainer of the project uh, rallies uh, among the community. So I think I only have five minutes, so I'm going to give some time for questions. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, there is a microphone here. I don't know if... Thank you. Did, were there any questions? I don't know. Any questions? Any feedback? Things that I missed, important things that I that I missed or something that you disagree with and you want to fight with me here on stage? Some punches, no? <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give another hand. Thank you so much, Ome. Okay, um, so we do have another talk coming up straight away that we're gonna get ready for, but we also have a workshop that is gonna be taking place. Um, you are needed elsewhere. Uh, I will talk with you in just a second.